Morning everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about how you can be paid to sleep, making on-call work for you. This isn't about catching a cheeky little nap in the data centre at four o'clock in the morning. Anyone else? No? Oh, one other, two others. Cool. At least I'm not alone. This is how to turn on-call into a guaranteed money spinner. Now, just on the advice of legal counsel, this is not guaranteed. Um, your mileage may vary. Um, you may have better luck earning money with other less volatile investments. Throwing a, a dart at a dartboard of cryptocurrency and investing in the first one. Uh, starting a lemonade stand, buying government debt, anything like that is probably more likely to get you a bit of a, a, a better return. Uh, it's not a pyramid scheme either, or a Ponzi scheme, or an inverted triangle, if that's uh, how you prefer to think about it. Uh, that is exactly what someone selling a pyramid scheme would say, but just trust me, okay. I'm going to tell you about not only how to get more sleep, but also how to do that while being paid more. So first off, a little bit of science. If you have interrupted sleep uh, for three years, you start to show signs of brain damage. If that interrupted sleep continues for 10 years or more, the damage is irreversible. Now I learned this uh, on good authority from someone at a conference a few years ago, either him or his sister or his brother-in-law uh, it was too long ago to remember exactly, uh, but someone he was close with was a brain surgeon. Um, and it, it stuck with me as like, uh, you know, that's a really interesting thing you know, that we're all putting ourselves through. So naturally, I did my own extensive research beyond that as soon as I got home. So I went to my favorite search engine, other search engines are available. Um, Popped does interrupt to sleep, give you brain damage into Google. Um, and yeah, it's true. It's demonstrated to be true. Now, when we're talking about missing sleep, we're not getting too extreme. Um, if anyone remembers this, it's 2004. It's a program called Shattered uh, on Channel 4. Of course, it was Channel 4. Um, what they did was they had participants and contestants in this game show stay awake for as long as they could. And the last one to fall asleep was the winner and won, I think, like 100 grand. Um, the person who won it stayed awake for 180 hours. For those of you without a calculator, um, that's over a week, uh, which is pretty... Yeah. Sorry? They are, they are fine, I think. I've not heard from them since, though. Um, but the, co the contestants before... I mean, that's awkward, anyway. Just trying to, try to stay awake while in bed and being filmed. Um, the contestants, before they did all pass out from exhaustion, were exhibiting uh, hallucinations, depression, really bad stuff. That's not necessarily how far we're going to go with this. This is about their kind of interrupted sleep patterns. Um, and it's becoming more commonplace, not just in tech, but in the whole economy, with, what with gigs, um, you know, the gig economy, shift workers. Um, and on call, in my opinion, fits into the category of gig economy, uh, because you don't know when your next set of hours is going to be. You might have no calls. You might have uh, a shed load of calls. I'm trying to censor my language, so apologies. It's something that slips through. Uh, you might have a lot of calls. Um, but you don't have a fixed set of hours that you work. And from looking into these different reports around how interrupted sleep affects your cognition, uh, it's high level cognition, so your uh, language, your planning, your understanding and processing of information, and also your prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, which affects your personality, your decision making, uh, your moderation of behavior, uh, all those things are what is affected by even interrupted sleep. Now, if you think about some of those things that are what I've just described, your personality, your behavior moderation, your decision making, there are a lot of what makes you, you as a person. Um, and the fact that just missing out on a bit of sleep because you've been called out at night can affect that is pretty scary. But also, Planning, understanding, and processing information, and the decision-making as well, are all massively important parts of on-call response and dealing with an incident. Gemma said yesterday, no human should be able to do something disastrous no matter how sleep-deprived they are. And it's apt. And when she said it, I was like, yes, perfect, stealing that, putting it in the talk. I did say tell her beforehand that I was doing it, so thank you. Um, but yeah, like if you... If you're on an on-call shift and you have two needless call-outs early on in your shift, and then the third call-out in that night 
is actually something that you really need to be dealing with, you know, fresh, fresh eyes, fresh brain, and you're not, that's going to cause a whole load of other problems down the line. Um, and of course, let's not even start, get started on the physical effects of lack of sleep. So you recovery from injury, your immune system screws up when you're not uh, sleeping properly, so you get poorly. It's just bad, really bad. And all these studies have shown that this, these effects of sleep deprivation um, continue even through restoring alertness through what they call stimulant countermeasures. So I take that to mean coffee, but you know, wh whatever you use, to keep you going is, is fine, no judgment. I went down a rabbit hole with this, you know, once you get onto Google, once you get onto the internet, you just, you know what, I, I went completely, uh, completely to town on it. So there's been a lot of studies also about the effects of being available for work. So not just being called out in the middle of the night, but being on a retainer, um, having to think about work when you're not physically doing work. Um, the summary there, kind of reinforces what everyone knows. Um, if an employee is supposed to be thinking about work and remaining available for work, they can't consider their time away from work to be leisure time. They can't relax. Um, most people that know left on on-call will agree that you can't switch off if you're on-call. And it boils down to the fact that on-call sucks. Uh, they said something different the other day. Um, on-call is bad. Um, and there's no getting away from that. So there's the annoyance of having just finished working on a call for another one to come through straight away. I've heard horror stories of, you know, getting a call while you're getting a manicure. Secondhand anecdote, of course. Um, getting a call while you're at the gym. Secondhand anecdote, of course. Um, <laughs> at a barbecue, uh, everything like this. But what can you actually do? Just not leave the house for the week that you're on call? There's the confusion as your phone rings um, at three o'clock in the morning. Embarrassment when you get buzzed at a restaurant. Sadness when you miss your child's party or a trip to the trampoline park. These are first-hand uh, experiences, these ones. And on top of these, there's the feeling of dread that follows you around while you're on call, inability to relax, and of course, being the most antisocial version of yourself. I send this meme to my wife every year around Christmas, because I'm always on call over Christmas. Um, and uh, you know, she puts up with it, but it is a thing, I, I feel like. I'm dragging my laptop around to all family functions. So, oh yeah, who am I? Um, I'm Oz, I'm operations manager in data at Sky Betting and Gaming. I've got 11 years plus uh, in the industry, being tech. Three of those years have been spent calling people out and the rest is being called out. There's a bit of a, a, bit of a waiting issue there. I've been on call as often as one in two while I was working as a network engineer for an ISP, which was hell. Uh, the on-call was bad too. I've had several calls per night to none for weeks. Guess which one is more preferred. And I am here on the dime of my employer, thank you. Uh, but the views here are my own, um, unless you agree with them, in which case they are my employers, uh, I guess. Before I went, uh, worked in tech, I was in a whole different kind of industry. I worked in a bar um, and I worked as a Jaeger dude. So if you ever bought a shot of Jägermeister from a guy in a stag outfit in Sheffield or the surrounding area in the late 2000s. It's probably me. You're welcome. Uh, late nights. I'm also a dad of two. Um, I put this photo on there, like eight and four now. That's just maximum R value. But no one said R, so you must be dead inside. No, it's fine. It's, it's, I don't care about it now. Um, someone said yesterday that you, it takes you five years to recover from a newborn. So there's four years between mine and one of them is four. So that would explain a lot if I'm still not recovered. Basically, I'm tired. These are my credentials. I'm tired and I'm used to it. But before we go any further, there is an elephant in the boardroom we need to address. You should be getting paid some kind of retainer for on call. I'm not, about, I'm not on about um, if you actually get called out and spend time, you need to be paid for that because otherwise I think that's like illegal. Um, but if you are expected to be thinking about work while you're not at work, you should be paid for the time. Whether that's in addition to your salary um, just for the year or whether that's you know a couple of hundred pound a week for the week that you're on call. Uh, if that's not the case, sort that out please uh, for your own sake. Um, but the rest of the stuff is still relevant in this talk, but it's just called sleep, I guess, instead of paid to sleep. So being paid to sleep comes down to three simple things. 
reliable systems, sensible alerting and monitoring, and luck. The first one we'll talk about is reliable systems. Reliable systems, I've done a couple of talks on this previously, a lot drier than this one to be honest. Uh, a couple of blog posts, a lot of further rec uh, reading recommendations. Um, Reliable Systems is a presentation and a discipline and a conference all on its own. Uh, the TLDR, or too long did not attend, I guess, is you don't want your systems to go down, but if they do, they need to do so in a sensible way. So we're talking about putting queues in place, retries, failovers, all that good stuff, so that if a system over here that relies on a system over here breaks, this one over here doesn't really care. It can. I guess carry on functioning, not at optimum, but enough so that people don't really notice. It's about having the right resources. Um, and you know, I, you notice I said reliable systems, and now I'm on about resources and people. Like, yeah, people are systems too. I know we don't like to think of them as people being systems and resources and other, you know, non human terms, but at the end of the day, people are systems and they're extremely buggy. Um, so yeah, the right resources, boring stuff like documentation. Um, John Topper did a really good talk, he's done it a few times, I think he did it at a previous DevOps Days London, boring is powerful. The boring stuff nobody ever thinks about, but it is the stuff that saves your bacon. A service can't go live without documentation. It's a, a nice little check mark that you have against a service going live. Is there a document about it? If no, sorry, it's not production ready. Does the documentation pass the 3 a.m. test? A document existing is not documentation, right? <laughs> I can say, yeah, there's a document here, go to that. And it's just a, I don't know, an HLD of a system? I'm like, what's that about? Why, how does that help me? Now, I'm not saying that your on-call documentation has to be, has to cater for every eventuality, take away your agency as a responding engineer, but at least a bit of a, a bit of signposting to useful log lines or useful recurring errors. If this, try this, if this, try this. You know, it goes a long way. If you can't wake up and read the documentation and grok it at 3 a.m., it's not really useful. Training on incident response is another good thing to do. So running weekly fire drills, testing out your incident response, not just to see how your systems, computer systems react, but how your people systems react and how your processes react. Google do, or did, I don't know if they still do, this fantastic thing called Dirt Week, which I think is disaster recovery testing. Um, they'll just ring an engineer uh, while they're getting on with their day job and say, uh, hello, the core database has gone, I don't know if Google has a core database, that'd be scary if they have just one. But anyway, um, the core database has gone down, can you talk me through how you'd recover this please? And you have to talk through how you do it. Really good idea. Um, they're not intended to breed complacency. A lot of people criticize the fire drill um, kind of approach because people just end up going through the motions and think, oh yeah, there's, here's a real incident, I'll just handle it like a fire drill. They're not meant to do that, it's meant to breed familiarity with a process uh, rather than complacency and help people feel more confident when they are actually responding to an incident. There's a big difference. Uh, Charity Majors said this in a talk, uh, this is the correct response to a call out. Uh, I've again censored it, it's flipping heck. Uh, you should it sounds a bit counterintuitive to say I have no idea what this call out is about. But if you're getting a call out in the middle of the night and it's, oh yeah, this again, like, why has that not been fixed up to now? Um, it, obviously that's easier said than done given resourcing problems, but this is the gold standard. Like, otherwise it's just an unnecessary strain on engineers. You lose an engineer for the morning because they got a call out at 6.30 for this problem again. Um, at which took them like an hour to fix, or even shorter. Even if it takes like 30 minutes, the context switch, they woke up too early, they've you know, had, a, had a delayed start to their day, they're not gonna be at their optimum, optimum at their best until later on in the day than planned. This uh, XKCD thing about how long something takes to automate, how long it takes to do, and how often you do it, um, is kind of relevant to that. Like if you have something that calls you out every Sunday because that's your peak, and it takes an hour to fix. If that happens more than once, then surely you've got to start thinking about fixing it for the health of your engineers. Uh, next, we're talking about sensible alerting and monitoring. So it's just making sure that the right people are responding to these alerts for a start. 
that includes developers on call. Um, Matty specifically called this out as being not DevOps. Um, on its own, it's not DevOps, but as part of a collection of you know, culture and things, it is. Um, this DevOps thing is, uh, is really cool, like service ownership, but you build it, you run it, shortening feedback loops, fantastic. You get your developers on call, they know exactly what the problems are. It's definitely gonna catch on. Only alert on what you need to alert on. If you have a NFS share, that, you know, 100 servers share, does every single one of them need to be telling you within a 15 minute interval, I'm full by the way, yeah, I'm full, I'm full too. Yeah, we're all full, you're all full, you're all using it. Like, think about your alerts, think about how your, how your alerts are contributing to alert fatigue and engineer fatigue. Only alert when you need to alert. So this is a real world example. Uh, warning, the important data file does not exist, right? It's not supposed to exist until 8 a.m., but we have it alert from 6 a.m. So what's the obvious thing to do? Change the alert to alert from 8 a.m. How many days did it take for someone to suggest and do that? More than one. <laughs> uh, it was nearly a week, like, it's, it's, uh, it's not ideal. It's about having the right people for the job. So having, the best I've ever seen this for on call is having multiple pools of engineers, uh, previous, previous job, uh, including developers, uh, multiple different domains of developers, operations info, et cetera, all on one shared primary rotor. So multiple different rotors of disciplines, and then one of them is cycling around primary. Um, they're all on call at the same time, even though the primary changes, and then the primary can, can escalate to the SME if needed. I've not seen it done better than that. That, to me, is like the peak of how it should be. Um, I will forever try and get that in place every possible job I do in future, because it, just, it was just a utopia. But multi-discipline rotors don't always work. So now it's time for an anecdote. And on these anecdotes, I need to make it clear that I'm not throwing shade at anyone or any future, uh, future employers, any previous employers or previous colleagues. This one's uh, called Flipping Network Engineers. I was one, I can say this. So this is back when I was working somewhere with a, a shared SysOps Network Ops shared rotor. Uh, the delivery team's strangely absent from on-call rotor, which, you know, make of that what you will. There's an alert in the middle of the night that fires because of an unplanned, but graceful, because there are guardrails, uh, failover of a very important database. The network engineer gets this alert and uh, sees that the database is having some problems, so thinks, you know what, I'll turn it off and on again. I'll restart MySQL D on what is now the new primary. Never mind, it'll fail back over again. The other database was in a healthy secondary state, it's fine. It's taken a bit of a while to stop MySQL D. You know, it's, it's done MySQL, service MySQL D stop, and it's just hanging there. So it's control C, control C. You know, it's, it's doing its replication checks, it's, data sense checked, making sure that it's not gonna fail everything um, just by failing over this, this database. So what it does is it does pkill minus nine MySQL D. <laughs> now, the general murmuring and laughter tells me that most people get that. If you don't, it will just kill it dead regardless of what it's doing. Uh, it doesn't care if it's in the middle of data replication back to the new primary. Um, it, that was like a, a couple of days to fix that. I had the joy of coming in 9 a.m. the next day. Multi-discipline rotors don't always work. It shouldn't require know-it-alls, right? We don't, that's a bit of an extreme example because don't just, don't just kill it dead. Um, but what followed with that was a multi-day cleanup which could have been resolved by a simple 10-minute call to an SME on databases or systems or whatever. Um, and this comes to culture. You know, it requires a culture where you can have a go, be wrong, ask for help without fear of blame, retribution, without needing to chase your losses. Like he restarted MySQL D and he's like, oh no, this wasn't the right thing to do. I'd better cancel killing MySQL D by canceling it more and just chasing your losses, always a bad thing. It needs a culture that fosters learning. Um, great for sharing the load between engineers, but it does require uh, quite a specific kind of culture. Relying on a service desk. Again, no shade to service desks. I've been on a service desk, they are 
Yeah, no help. Um, but a service desk, you're effectively relying on a human to pass your alerts instead of a computer. Uh, humans are lazy. Um, you can get very eager service desks. So this is in the middle of the night. I get a phone call. There's a critical alert on the core database. All oh, right, OK. I don't have access to the monitoring like just on my phone. What does the alert say? It says, MySQL replication lag. Don't call out between 1 and 5. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, but it had been there a while. I thought I'd better check. Yeah, I can kind of guess it might have been there around two hours since one o'clock. And they also go to the not so eager, working for an ISP that mainly dealt with like student accommodation and large blocks of flats. Um, get to the office on 8 a.m. on a Monday, and one of the sites has been completely down since Sunday lunchtime. Oh, I must have missed that. And this has gone through multiple shifts of service desk. We've got a 24-hour SLA to get a replacement on site with this company before we have to start paying a lot of money in service credits and things. Uh, and it's been down 19 hours at this point. So five hours to go. It's doable. It's doable. It's in Aberdeen. We're in Sheffield. That's probably a five-hour drive. Um, but I don't blame the service desk for calling out or not calling out. If an alert shouldn't be there, then it shouldn't be there. If an alert needs acknowledging and hasn't been, like make a bit of noise, don't just rely on a human. Computer systems are unpredictable, but they do kind of do what they're told a lot of the time. Humans don't at all. Like, don't rely on a human when a computer could do the work for you. Tuning your alerts. This one is about a third-party monolith app, uh, a complete black box. As our services are getting busier and busier, we notice that we are starting to clip critical levels during peak load. There's quite a bit of headroom still on the nodes, um, so let's just up the threshold of these alerts. We're still hitting the threshold. This isn't good. We're not feeling comfortable about this, you know, carrying on ourselves. Let's ask the vendor what's safe. They don't know. They just put, put a number on. They don't, they don't even know. Um, we set our own thresholds now because even vendors don't have an idea. Cover up my uh, GCP logo while I'm talking about that. Uh, even vendors don't have a, an idea about what they're doing. It wasn't Google, by the way. It's fine. Um, this is a more recent example, slow data processing. Towards the end of the year, data processing jobs that look at January the 1st to now take longer to run. Simple math, right? You've got more records to churn through. We start tripping thresholds for long-running job, which is just a number of minutes that a job has elapsed for. So change the threshold. Yeah, but then we're going to be blind to it come January when it should be running faster. We won't know. Let's change it back. Simple, right? You're not bound by your previous decisions, but if your monitoring is stale and stagnant and static, that's not fit for purpose. Absolutely not fit for purpose. And the final thing is look. This is the easiest to influence. That was sarcasm, by the way. You can have perfect systems and alerts. You still need luck to be on your side. It's just my luck that on my first ever night on call as a network engineer, we dropped 10% of users uncovered a bug in our core routers that meant it would cascade failure, and every time they tried to reconnect to another router, it would fail that as well. Absolute nightmare. Um, so, yeah, just my luck. Just my luck I worked for an ISP during the uh, Talk Talk hack. It wasn't Talk Talk, thankfully. If you remember that, it was uh, someone got access to their uh, systems and uh, a lot of data, a lot of data. Um, but we, got, we went into panic mode. Um, some security researcher think he thought he found something similar on our platform. He hadn't, thankfully. Uh, but we didn't know that at the time. We thought he had. So spending, the uh, spending overnight re-architecting networks, fixing five-year-old tech debt, um, it got to the point where my wife texted me and was like, if you don't come home now, I'm going to ring your boss until he's awake. And I'm going to get him to personally come into the office and take over the job instead of you. So I was like, OK, yeah. A lot of respect for my wife. She, she does keep me uh, on the straight and narrow. And record-breaking multi-terabit per second DDoS attempts always happen at the most inopportune times. Always. It's just, you know, I don't make the rules. It's just what they are. Uh, these are all pub stories, unfortunately, because they're still too near to now to be uh, fully out there. It comes down to this, you control what you can, you embrace what you can't. As you control more and more and tame more and more of what you can, 
the amount of stuff that you can't control, like your time bombs, gets smaller. Ultimately, we need to put the work in as engineers, as leaders, advocates, to stand up for people that are on call, even if it is ourselves. Uh, because being woken up in the middle of the night is not just an inconvenience, it is provably and demonstrably detrimental to your health, mental and physical. And that's me. Thank you for listening. Uh, here are many of the ways you can find me online. There are hundreds more. Uh, I seem to have a, a habit of collecting single source of truth bio pages just for the funky URL. So if you just put holes into Google, it'll probably show up. Um, yeah, grab me afterwards if you have any questions. <laughs>